Good morning, church. It's good to hear joyful noise. <laughs> so we're going to do some more joyful noise by singing. So would you stand up with us? Oh, all my kids are here, so we're good. Uh, last weekend, uh, how many of you were with us at the mountains? A few? Yay. <laughs> we had a wonderful time. So if you came last week and you did not see uh, anyone, it's not because the doors of heaven were closed. <laughs> it's just we were at the mountains. Um, we had some great testimonies there. And one of the things that was interesting, uh, Bright was sharing a testimony. And he said, in America, you guys have, uh, we're in Western culture, you guys have health insurance. But uh, in Africa, we have blessed assurance. So today we're going to sing about blessed assurance, right? We may not have health insurance and all kinds of insurances or life insurance. We have blessed assurance because there's things happening in our lives that have nothing to do with no insurance can cover apart from the blessed assurance. So David says, because David went through a lot of issues. So he says, praise be to the Lord for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song I praise him. So I want for us today, leap, jump, do whatever, just don't be chaotic. I'm not very charismatic, so either way, but sometimes I'll jump. But one time my, my phone flew, so now I have no pockets in my, you know, so I, I'm not embarrassed. But yeah, just sing, feel free just to express yourself in worship this morning. I like my heavy Bible. So we're going to sing about Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine, amen.
to do so. I just on a Sunday morning. Lord, I come. I confess. this morning and I know we do let's just take a few moments and just ask for him plead for him to intervene in your life in Ukraine in our world because our our world is gone crazy so let just let his people unite forces in prayer because prayer works and I think sometimes we just undermine prayer it just become a habit of uh, Lord thank you for this meal and that's it but let's just really intercede for our friends for our lives for whoever we want for God to, to work in their life. So let's just take this moment, just Lord, come, because we need you.
Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Hmm. Yes, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. <coughs> yes, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Lord, your name is beautiful. We thank you, Jesus, that we can live unashamed, and I pray that we will. So many times, Lord, we are just so comfortable with just saying, I'm going to live my faith, but I'm not going to talk about it. Help us, Jesus, not to be ashamed of saying Jesus in our normal conversations, Jesus. May every conversation we have with people, may every interaction we have with them, may point to you, may it bring a conversation of the gospel. Help us, Lord, to live intentional lives because we're running out of time. Thank you, Jesus, for opportunities to use us. Lord, help us to declare that your name is beautiful. Amen. We were yesterday at the Ukrainian service. By the way, I don't know if you know, there's a Ukrainian service each Saturday. It's not here. And last night my father preached. He's a cute short man just like me and uh, but he's a really good preacher so he shared the gospel very clearly and a lady every single time we've had each Saturday we have a lot of non-believers every single time so um, a lady comes and she's in tears after the service and she says Natty I've, I've been to the Orthodox chur Church here at Easter it was dark it was scary for my little boy. There was a lot of candles. I didn't understand anything. It was dark. And then I asked myself, what am I doing here in this dark place? 
And then she said, yesterday in tears, but today I saw the light. I understood the gospel. I understood the message. Today I accepted Jesus in my heart. Praise God. But it was because somebody declared Jesus and the gospel verbally. So I pray that just as we sing this song, I hope that during the week we're going to remember. It's imp important for us not just to live our faith. It is. But to talk about our faith. To be vocal. Because Jesus' name is powerful. It's in the name of Jesus wonderful. It's in the name of Jesus wonderful. this song before we listen to God's word and also we'll have in a little bit um, a way to thank God for what he how he has blessed us in our life so we'll have uh, an offering but also prepare your hearts for the message speak for I am listening she my inner way my soul to answer my
Would you pray with me? Father, we come as those who once were blind, but now we see clearly. Those that were like that woman we just heard about that was lost in darkness, but Lord, your light broke through our darkness and allowed us to see your beauty, allowed us to see who you are, and our hearts fell in love. We embraced you and we found hope, hope to sustain us in these days in which we live. And Lord, now we come hungry to be fed, hungry for your spirit to speak through your word, to minister hope and healing, to minister courage to those who are discouraged, to be what we need. So, Lord Jesus, we look to you today and we ask you to speak, to speak to our souls. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please have a seat? Got just a few things I want to share with you before Stuart comes with the morning message. Saturday, or, 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 over the uh, last couple of weeks, we have been working as a church to prepare a few things to get ready for some really important things that we hope to see happen in our church in the weeks to come. Several years ago, when I became the pastor of the International Church, one of the things that was really interesting to me was is that the Lord showed us that there was a lot of things that needed to be done, and one of the things that needed to be done is we needed to work on encouraging and developing more areas of leadership throughout the church. Well, many of us gathered here in this room yesterday, and we discussed what is happening in the church and what our dreams are for what we hope that God will do in the future as well. We would like to encourage you to participate in it. The first thing that we want each one of us to know is that we are completely dependent upon him to help us to do this. The scripture says clearly, unless the Lord builds a house, those that labor, they will labor in vain. And so we trust completely wholly in the Lord to guide us through this process. But each one of us are members of his household. Each one of us are members of his church. And so we need for you to participate in this process. You might have noticed when you came in here today, there's some things on the wall over here. And no, that's not the children having just a lot of spare time. We need your help because we're trying to work to develop something that we believe God wants to lead us to do in the future. What you'll find over here on one of the radiators is a little post-it pad and some pens. And we would like to encourage you to come and take one of these. And as you look at some of the different areas of ministry, some of the different things that are going on, maybe you might have ideas that will help us as we develop and as we look to the future. What we'd like for you to do is that for some of the ideas that you have, maybe it specifically has to do with children's ministry, maybe it has to do with youth ministry, or how we reach our community. Whatever it is, we'd like for you to take one of these little post-its Write your name on it, because we not, not because we necessarily want to chase you down, but we would like to include you in the process. So write your name on it, and then kind of write your little idea. And if you can, post it on one of the sheets up there that your idea has to do with. And we will take that into consideration as we develop things. Our hope is, is that in the next few months, we're going to see God do something extraordinary with that as several rise up and several of us take positions of leadership, and we see God use us to do something extraordinary in our community as we try to reach them with the gospel of Christ. Wouldn't you like to be part of that? I think you would, and I know I'm excited to be part of it, and I look forward to what God is going to do through it. So please, after the service, if you can, go take one of these posts, take a pen, and please give us your ideas. We're going to do that over the next two or three weeks, and we're going to collect all that data, all that information, and we're going to see what God will do through that. i got just two other real quick announcements. Next Sunday, can I encourage you? I know that probably our lives are busy. There's a lot of things going on, but if you're here in Bucharest, please come. We have a special guest next Sunday that I would love for you, to, uh, love to introduce to you. One of the pastors of the church that I come from in the United States at Faith Church in Lafayette, Indiana, is going to be here with us, and he's going to be sharing the morning message. And I'd like to introduce Rob Green to you, him and his family. They're a sweet family. He's uh, not only been a great asset to the church there, I can tell you personally, he's spoken truth into our lives, and we have been blessed by him. And I guarantee you, you will be privileged, and you will not regret coming next Sunday to hear the message that God's placed upon Rob's heart. So I would encourage you to set that time aside and make sure that you're in worship with us next Sunday. Finally, 
as you know, many of us gather at about 9.30, 9.45 over here in the side room for prayer on Sunday. And can I encourage you? I know sometimes it's like, boy, Pastor, you know, I, I, I don't get many times to sleep in, and I, I want to take advantage of those few extra moments. Can I encourage you with something? If you give just a few extra moments to Jesus, you'll never regret it. So if you just come and join us in prayer over here as the side as we not only prepare for worship, but as we're praying about all the things happening around us, I guarantee you, you'll be encouraged by it as well. So I hope that next Sunday, many of you will come and join us for our time of prayer over here in the side room. Stu, come and share with us this morning what God's put upon your heart. Good morning. Hopefully, yep, it sounds like I'm on. <laughs> That's always a good start. Thank you. Good. This thing doesn't like to fit my head for some reason. It seems to always pop off, but <laughs> I think we're good. It's good to, to see you. Uh, it's good to, to have our regular church family with us, and I know there's a few visitors or people here for the first time. Special welcome to you if it's one of your first times with us. Let me just get what I need. We're going to uh, look at John chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles or your apps, just I may as well get, give you the chance to get there while I'm trying to get there myself. Uh, John chapter 11. And we're going to read from verse uh, 17. John chapter 11, starting at verse 17. We don't always read the whole passage, but I think it might be helpful just to, to see the context of what I'm talking about today. So we're going to read through quite a bit um, from verse 17 to verse 44. By the end of this, you'll already be tired of my voice, but <laughs> uh, let's follow along. I'm reading in the New Living Translation, if that helps you, if you're on an app and you want to read in the same version, or sometimes it's helpful to listen to one version and read in another version anyway. So starting at verse 17, when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house, or literally sat at home. It's a position of mourning, staying sat down in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, said Martha, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. And Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live, even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the, word from God, into the world from God. Then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and he wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. Jesus had stayed outside the village at the place where Martha had met him. When the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep, so they followed her there. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him, he asked. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. The, roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. 
But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, Didn't I tell you that you would see the glory, you would see God's glory if you believed? So they rolled the stone away. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said this out loud for the sake of all these people standing here, so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a headcloth. And Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. It might seem like an odd title to the message today, When God Seems Too Late. But I think you'll see we can often have moments in our lives where we can feel that that's the case. Do you ever wonder where God is in a situation? Maybe something you're wrestling with right now. Maybe when you hear news of a loved one who's sick, who's maybe got a few days left to live. When you hear of someone who's passed away. When you're in relationship with God, but you keep listening for him, but feel like he's, in a, he's being silent for a season, and, and that can be painful. God, where are you? What's going on? Why are you not communicating with me when I'm speaking to you? And especially in the current circumstances of the war, there's so many questions of, God, why are you not intervening more than we're seeing you intervene at the moment? Where are you? What is going on? These are very real questions and a very real response in our human hearts to difficulties that may come our way. I actually think that when we wrestle with these kind of questions, it's actually a sign of our faith. When we, it, we, we believe that God can and should and does act, and so when we start to question why are you not doing it, it actually shows that deep down we believe he can. We're just wondering why he isn't, at least in our understanding at this, at this time. There's, there is faith there when we're wrestling with these things. Uh, questioning shows that we have faith. We have an expectation that God should be doing something, and we're just wondering why he doesn't seem to be. We know verses like Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 to 11, where it says, "If what good father, when asked for bread, would give a stone? Well, sometimes we might feel like we're asking God for bread, and, and the best we're getting is stale bread, at least. It's not a stone, but it's not the fresh bread that we're asking for. If we're honest, we can feel like that, can't we, in some situations? God isn't answering as we think he ought to. Um, Is he really a good father in those circumstances? We can think. Other verses like Romans 8, verse 28, where it says that God works all things for the good of those who love him. The reality is sometimes we can be in a circumstance, in a situation, and we are just struggling to see where there's any good in this circumstance whatsoever. Well, Mary and Martha are in this place right now in our story. They're wrestling with all, these, all of these questions. Jesus, where were you? Where were you when we needed you most? We see, you probably picked up that both Martha and then later Mary say the same thing. It's actually word for word. They say, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. God, if you'd intervened, if you'd been here, Jesus, if you'd been here Physically, Lazarus wouldn't have died. We can say the same thing. God, if you had been here, if you had shown up in this circumstance, it wouldn't have ended like this. Their united cry, the fact that it's word for word, probably implies that even back home before meeting Jesus, they'd been having these conversations. They'd been wrestling through it together. And the first thing they approach Jesus with is, if you were here, he wouldn't have died. Deep down, they knew Deep down, they knew that Jesus loved them. They knew that Jesus could heal, could have restored Lazarus. But they are wrestling with these tough questions of why. Where were you? Why didn't you hear? Why didn't you respond? And friends, I think this is normal. I think many of us might be in a difficult situation right now. I know many are connected with what's going on with the war, either personally or have come to be involved in helping with relief work. All of these questions are being raised up, and I know there are others in the church who have got loved ones who are suffering with sickness. I know there are lots of things going on, and and it's normal to ask these questions. God, where are you? If only you were here, if only I could see you moving. 
And the Bible doesn't tell us that these feelings are wrong, that we shouldn't ask these questions. In fact, we see in the Psalms, many of the Psalms, that David just pouring out his heart, God, where are you in this circumstance? I'm being chased down. I'm run out of my hometown. I'm on my own. Where are you? The Bible doesn't say we shouldn't ask those things. But the Bible does speak loudly about making sure our hearts and our minds are connected to the truth um, that, is, that outweighs the feelings that we might be going through in those circumstances. So I think today's passage as we work through will hopefully be an encouragement and a reminder of where our hearts, where our focus, where our minds need to be, need to be when we're wrestling with difficult challenges in life. We're going to look at three different responses that Jesus has to three different occasions that he's kind of doubted and and questioned. Um, We're going to see, we'll come to it in a moment, we're going to see that to Martha he speaks hope through speaking the truth. We're going to see that to Mary he shares sympathy with her through his tears. And to the Jews he shows his glory through transformation. All of these responses that he gives to the three different people or groups of people that are questioning his, his love, his power, his, his decision, all of these things affirm his love to them. So let's just pray, because this is a, not an easy thing to, to talk through sometimes, especially for those who are in a, in a deep, dark place at the moment. But let's pray that by, by the Holy Spirit's power, he would speak the words of comfort, the words of truth that we need to hear today. So let me pray. We've just sang, Holy Spirit, come and move through the power of your word. Holy Spirit, you are the comforter. You are the one who brings these words on a page or on an app that brings them to life in our hearts and makes them go deep so that they are a rock that we can stand upon. So we pray this morning, God, that you would speak powerfully. Speak individually, personally, to each person here, whatever situation they are wrestling with. God, may they be caused to look to you and to trust. Not that the answers are necessarily given, not that the the weight or the pain is over, but there is a hope in which they can rest. God, we pray that you would move through this passage and through what what you are speaking here this morning for your glory. Amen. So firstly, in our despair, Jesus speaks hope through truth. In our times of despair, if we're listening to Jesus, he will speak hope by reminding us of the truth. In verse 21, when Martha comes to meet Jesus on the way, she's coming in despair. She's coming with that phrase, if only you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And that phrase might seem like an accusation, like she's putting the blame on Jesus, If you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. And so the fact he's died, it's your fault, etc. But the truth, um, but the context, if we look at the next thing she says, where she says, um, but I know even now God will give you whatever you ask. It shows there's this battle going on inside of like wrestling with the feelings. Why weren't you here? Why weren't you here? Why didn't you move when we needed you? Yet I'm going to trust that there's something else going on, that you are still who you claim to be. You are still the Son of God. God will still respond um, to what you ask him to do. She's wrestling. She's in that place, the friction between the heart and the feelings and the mind that she's holding on to the truth and just wrestling with that. And I think I certainly experienced that many times, wrestling with the truth in the midst of a difficult circumstance when the feelings are, are not quite ready to agree with the truth. She is wrestling. The truth is Jesus loves her, loves Lazarus, Lazarus, and could intervene. But she, it, she's wrestling with the fact that he didn't. And so where is his love? Why didn't, he, why didn't he act? There's no indication here, I don't think, in the passage that Martha is expecting Jesus to raise him from the dead. Um, we see that later on because when Jesus says, roll away the stone, she is the one who says, no, no, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stink. She's not expecting Lazarus to be raised, but she is still trusting that there is something God-ordained in all of this. And that's, we can't understand what necessarily we can from this passage, but sometimes in our circumstances, 
We can't see what God is doing in the midst of the pain, but we are still invited to trust that he is sovereign, that he is good. Do you feel her despair? Have you done? Have you been there? Are you there now in the present? Are you desperate for God to intervene in some way? You're certain that he can help, that he can heal, that he can provide what you're needing. He can guide you where you feel a lack of direction. He can restore health. He can restore relationship. But he hasn't done yet. Why hasn't he? Why haven't you, God? These are the questions and doubts that bubble in our hearts under the surface when we're wrestling um, with a, a tough situation. We ask, did he hear or does he hear? Does he care? Is he good? Like, he's not answered so far. He's supposedly a good God. But I'm not sure I can believe that right now. We can wrestle with that. That's what's going on in our hearts, in our feelings, in our emotions. And meanwhile, our mind is trying desperately to hold on to the truth. He does hear. He does care. He is good. So let's look and see how does Jesus respond to Martha when she's come in this, this wrestling between heart, feelings, and mind, and what she knows is true. How does Jesus respond? In verse 23, he says, your brother will rise again. Now, this seems like a, an odd thing to say, but Martha doesn't receive it in an odd way. She actually says, yes, I, I know. I know that in, at the end times, he's going to come. Uh, sorry, the dead will rise. He, she knows this. And this is something that has been taught through prophecies, through the Old Testament. For example, in Daniel, um, Daniel chapter 12, it says, There will be a time of anguish, but at that time, every one of your people whose name is written in the book will be rescued. Many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up to some everlasting life and, to, and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. See, this, this concept of an eternal life and a resurrection at the end is not just something that comes from the New Testament and from what we know about Christ. It was prophesied long before, and Mary and Martha, they know this, and they trust in this, even though it's hard at the moment to trust in this. So when Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again, this is what she is assuming he's meaning. Uh, and it's probably a kind of common condolence that is offered back in, in, in those times. Ah, yeah, we know someone has passed away, but, you know, he will rise again or she will rise again. It's similar to what we might say today to try and comfort someone in their loss that he's in a better place now or you will see them again one day. And this is how Martha initially takes what Jesus says. And while I'm not trying to belittle those important words of comfort that we offer, um, especially when there's truth, like if we know the person has had a relationship with God and we have a relationship with God, we have this amazing assurance that we will see them again. But for Martha, those kind of words in her current grief don't offer much, much condolence, do they? If you've ever lost someone that you've loved dearly, I've actually had a friend this past week whose father has just passed away. And when I messaged him to say, hey, would you like me to call you? Or maybe you're not ready yet? Because I lost my own mum a, a few years ago. I kind of understood that he may not be in a place where he can talk yet. And he just replied, yeah, I'm not able to talk. Like, it's too emotional for him. And this is where Martha is at. Yes, yeah, she can hear those words of condolence, um, that reminder that there's something in the future, and that's right for her to hear those, but she can't, it doesn't meet her where she's at. So Jesus goes on to add more to what he's saying. and He looks at her. I, could, I mean, it doesn't say this in the passage, but I think he gets eye contact with her. And he says, Martha... Verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this, he says. This is not just the common words of condolence that Jewish people might offer at this time. This is something significantly more. It's not simply there's a day coming in the future where the dead will rise again and there will be new life. Keep waiting, keep holding on to that hope for the future. It is, Martha, I am here. This is found in me. 
in me there is new life. In me there is assurance of resurrection. There is new life to be had even now if you will believe in me and trust in me. The wait is over if you look to Jesus, and it's the same for us today. New life is, is offered to all of us. If we believe in Jesus, we should be living in the joy of new life. Jesus is saying, it is found in me. Eternal life is here, ready for you now. For the dead, those who have passed, yes, they will be raised to life on the, the last day. For those who are living now, there is new life in, in Jesus to be enjoyed. That this life shouldn't be uh, weighed down with the, the weight of the, world, the cares of the world. Yes, we, we go through those challenges. We go through the same things that the world goes through. Loss, war, um, difficult relationships. We go through those things. But for us, if we look to Jesus, there is life, even in the midst of those struggles. Jesus is saying, just like he's already said, um, there is abundant life for you. Just as, do you remember we looked a few weeks ago for those who were here? Um, when Jesus says he's the good shepherd, he offers his sheep abundant life. He is the one that, that leads them out to pasture and gives them what they need. He provides for every need. He leads them back to the sheepfold to protect them. Jesus, as the good shepherd, is everything that a sheep could need. He is everything that we can need if we look to him. He offers us a satisfied life. He says he's the bread of life. When we feast upon him, when we come to him, he will feed our hungry souls, not with physical food, but with exactly what we need to, to be able to trust in him and move forward. He protects us. He says he's the gate to the fold. And we are offered an accompanied life. We, he promises to be with us. Do you remember the light of the world was um, reflecting back to the pillar of fire that had traveled with the... Ill, the the Israelites through the wilderness, not the, yeah, I was going to say that the wrong way around. <laughs> um, the pillar of fire that had traveled with the Israelites through the wilderness, it had gone as a protection, as a guide for them. And Jesus, as the light of the world, is here for us to protect us, to guide us, to be a comfort to us. Jesus is saying again, it is me. I am the answer to everything that has been promised. I am the promise-keeping fulfillment of God. Martha, believe in me. Believe that every promise is fulfilled now in me. This is true for Martha, and it's true for us as well today. Trusting in Jesus, knowing and believing, even in the midst of difficulty, trusting in, in him and who he is, the fact that he is the promise keeper, the fact that in him all things are fulfilled, is a truth that outweighs even the heaviest present grief that we might be going through. It is a hope that outshines the darkest shadows of doubt that we might be wrestling with. And it is a reality that we can hold on to that surpasses even the very tangible circumstances that we are presently wrestling with. We hold on to Jesus, and, and as we do, it, it doesn't always change the circumstances, but it will change how we, how we can view those and how we can move forward with them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it says this, this is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small. It may not seem like that. But our present troubles are small, and they won't last very long. Look to the future. Look to the promised um, eternal life that we have. Yet they produce for us a glory that vast outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now but rather we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Again, I, I totally recognize, just like for Martha, there might, might be stuff that you're wrestling with, and it's still hard to hear this, but I'm, I want you to hear it. And it, it may be that you can't fully grasp this just yet, but keep reminding yourself of the truth of who it is that is sovereign over the circumstances. Keep looking to him. Keep applying that truth to your heart and your mind until it helps to shift your focus from the trouble to the one who has um, promised to make a way through. I know it's not easy, um, but it's important that we apply truth um, that combats the, the feelings that can weigh us down so much. Let's look at and see how uh, Jesus com comforts Mary now, in our grief, Jesus shares sympathy through tears. 
Just like Martha, we saw that Mary approaches and confronts Jesus with the same words. If you'd been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. But Mary's uh, confrontation with Jesus is different. Martha comes saying it, and, and, but yet saying, I, I'm still going to trust. She's in that place of wrestling. Martha, uh, Mary is just in a place of unconsolable grief. She is sobbing. The words used there are wailing, howling. Um, she is inconsolable. Is it inconsolable? Unconsolable. Inconsolable, I think, <laughs> is the word. She is just, she's not even wrestling with the questions. She's not even trying to find truth. She is just in the midst of full grief. And so Jesus doesn't respond to her with words. Yet he says, um, where, where's the tomb? And, and heads there later, but he doesn't speak to Mary directly. What, what the, the, the passage says, it depends what translation you are reading. Actually, from the New Living Translation, it says about anger. Often the words used in translation are um, deeply moved or greatly troubled. But the original word in the Greek is a word that means something along the lines of indignant or angry. Jesus was actually feeling, he felt internally, he felt anger um, at the situation. Now, he's not angry at Mary. He's not angry that she's in this place of grief and sobbing and he can't even talk to her. He's angry at the state of humanity, not with humanity, but he's angry at the state of humanity. He's grieving. He's angry that humans have to go through pain and grief. This was never the plan of God from, from the beginning of creation, that humanity would have to suffer like this. And Jesus is angry at, at how evil has got a hold upon humanity, meaning that there are things that we, we really wrestle with. Jesus is angry at the situation that has um, caused so much grief, so much hurt, and so much pain. While Jesus knows that one day these things will be gone, his heart is hurting at the present situation, and, and, and I think that's the same for us today. God knows, that Jesus, God knows that one day there's going to be peace across the whole earth. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth where there is no more war. He knows that there will be no more death. There will be no, no more pain. But there is, on this life now, there is struggles. There are hardships. And, and God is angered by that. He's grieved by that. Jesus moves towards the tomb and then his emotions that have been internal, that he's been empathizing with Mary, um, showing he kind of understands, but his, his internal emotions now become external. In verse 35, Jesus weeps with Mary. He's showing true sympathy. He's feeling the same things now that Mary is feeling. His tears are, the, are exactly what Mary needs where she is at. Mary needs to know that Jesus understands, that Jesus finds this horrific as well that Jesus is heartbroken by what's going on. Jesus' tears are a comfort to Mary in her grief, and she realizes he does care. She will need words of truth. She will need to be reminded of the truth later on, but right now, she just needs to, to know that someone agrees with, with where she's at. Someone understands where she's at, and Jesus comes alongside and weeps with her. And in our own struggles... Jesus does understand where we're at. Jesus weeps with us in the pain that we wrestle with. Yes, we need to apply truth, but there might be times where we just need to know that Jesus comes alongside. He's embracing you, saying, I get it. I hate this as much as you do. This is not what I really want for you. This is not what I want for Ukraine. This is not what I want for your loved family member who is wrestling with painful sickness. This is not what I want for your relationships that are a challenge he comes alongside and he, and he brings comfort and, and understanding. And maybe that's what you need a reminder of this morning. Hebrews 4 says this, verse 14, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, that us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses or with our pain or with our grief but who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us, draw, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Now this passage more specifically refers to Jesus understanding the, the temptations that we struggle with, 
But there are many other passages that that show us that Jesus, as a man on earth, he experienced all of these things. Jesus knew temptation. He experienced weariness in his ministry. He needed time away. He was tired. He experienced loneliness and abandonment. He experienced sorrow and grief. He knew rejection from one of his closest followers, from Judas, for example. He knew poverty. It says the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. He lived from one day to the next, not knowing where he would sleep, where his food would come from. He knew frustration when he went into the temple and saw what the Jewish people were doing and selling things there. He, he was frustrated at the, the, the extent to which sin had taken hold, even in the temple. Jesus knew all of these things. He knew disappointment. Jesus knew he experienced those things, and he knows our struggles and our pains. He does understand. He does care. He does want to come alongside and sometimes just grieve with you, just cry with you, just be angry at the situation with you. Again, in the Psalms, we see this many times too. Jesus does draw alongside to both comfort us in our deepest pain and to speak truth so that we can have hope and look to him for the future. He'll do this in season. With Mary, it was one thing. With Martha, it was another thing. Whatever season you are in, he knows what you need. Keep listening in case he's trying to speak truth that you need to grab hold of to to move forward and to fix your gaze upon him. But also just sit with him if that's what you need at this time and just know that his heart connects with yours and grieves with you. The third response, now in in the version I read, it was talking about some people, but in most versions it talks about Jews, which is likely that it is Jews. Um, And so um, we see these Jews have doubt. um, And the the next um, heading is that in our doubt, Jesus shows his glory through transformation. The Jews had come from nearby to gather with Mary and Martha and to join them in their grief. And this is a great thing for them to do to community, to join together, to weep with those who weep, to mourn with those who mourn. And when they see Jesus weeping with Mary, they recognize, many of them recognize in verse 36, oh, see how he did love them. He does love them. Some of the Jews see his response and realize he does love. They'd probably been wrestling with the same questions that both Mary and Martha had been wrestling with, but now they see But it does say that others are still doubting. Others there watching are still doubting, saying, well, he healed this blind man. He's done this. He's done that. Why didn't he help Lazarus? When he was even called by Mary and Martha and sent for, why didn't he come? They're still wrestling with this. Essentially, what's going on is they're they're doubting and questioning Jesus' love. And again, John records that Jesus has the same, probably more of an internal response of deeply moved Um, of um, having a troubled heart. It's the same word, indignant and angry. And I believe this time it's probably more angry towards them that they are still so unbelieving. We've seen throughout John the number of times that that the Jewish people see a miracle. They, They hear Jesus speaking the truth, and yet they still continue to doubt. They still continue to walk in blindness. They are doubting his love. They are doubting his power. And they are still blind to seeing who he really is. Earlier in the passage, as we looked at last week, I think verse 4, Jesus makes it clear that what is about to happen is for the glory of God. And now again, um, Jesus acts. He, He performs an incredible miracle to reveal the glory of God, to reveal his own glory and the glory of the Father. Jesus, um, Jesus says, remove the stone. And he calls Lazarus out, and Lazarus is raised to life. Now, this is a story we know so well that we often like, ah, yeah, Lazarus came back to life. But no, like, it's, what an incredible story. Jesus has raised a few other people already, but they were just dead, so to speak. Um, this is a four-day death, and, and all scientists would say, like, after three days, um, there's no, I don't know, there's no life anyway, but... Um, there's, a, there's a distinction, even in the culture, there was a belief that the spirit would depart from the body after a few days. And so four days in, there is no hope from anyone. No one expects anything to change. This is the situation. Lazarus is dead. And yet Jesus um, proves otherwise. And, and Jesus' goal in raising Lazarus from the dead is, is not 
for the sake of Lazarus or for the sake of Mary or Martha to bring them comfort to give Lazarus life, life again. I mean, if we think about it, how is that really a huge help? Ultimately, Lazarus is going to have to die again. He's not with us still, so he died twice. And Mary and Martha would still have to wrestle with the grief of that another time if he died before then. The goal in raising Lazarus from the dead is not to bring him back to life, but it is to give a tangible example, tangible evidence that the words he has spoken to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, the things that he has taught all throughout the Gospel of John, all throughout his ministry, that I am the good shepherd, come to me, I am the fulfillment of all the promises of God. It's a tangible evidence that all of those things are true, that Jesus is who he says he is, that God is glorified through this man, Jesus, that Jesus is more than the man, he is God himself being glorified. Jesus is at work to bring glory to the Father, and, and in this situation, the way that happens is to raise Lazarus to life. Right in front of these Jews who are still un- doubting, even though they've seen so many things, he, he again, <laughs> grace, isn't it? Like he, Graciously, he gives them another opportunity to see the truth in a tangible way, in the hope that they might respond. And we see um, at the end of the passage, I think the next verse beyond what we read, some of the Jews then believed each miracle Jesus does, you've got this division, but each time a few more seem to, seem to start to get it. And, and just to make it super clear that what Jesus is doing in raising Lazarus to life is for the glory of God, Jesus prays out loud. Did you notice that in verse 41 and 42? It's an interesting language. Um, I think I've got it on the screen. Yeah. Um, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you would always hear me. But I said this out loud on account of the people standing here. It's an unusual prayer. It's not just Jesus praying to his Father. It's actually praying to be heard so that others will see that actually the relationship that Jesus has with his Father is a close one where the Father does hear, does respond. And that should be an encouragement to us as the children of God that as we come and as we pray to God as Father, he does hear, he does respond. We may not always like the response or like the timing of the response or see what he's actually doing at the time. But we can have comfort in this that when we do pray to God, he does hear us because we are his children. But Jesus says this to make sure that the people know that it is God at work in raising Lazarus to life. It is God's glory at stake. And so he then demonstrates this practically by calling Lazarus out. He demonstrates his glory through transforming Lazarus from from dead to life. In John chapter 5, verse 24, it says, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. For those who trust in Jesus, um, yes, our physical bodies will die, and we struggle with them day by day as well, but when but our, our spiritual, our, our, our soul, our spirit is alive, and when our physical bodies pass away, we will not pass through judgment as others who haven't trusted in, in Jesus will do, because we are alive in Christ now and forever. This is a visible demon, demonstration in the flesh of what is promised to those who trust and believe in Jesus in the Spirit, those who believe in Jesus. This is an act of unrivaled power, revealing immeasurable love. And I I don't mean the act of raising Lazarus to to life, although it is. I mean the act of uh, God opening up his very presence, his very self, his very heart to, to those who will trust in Jesus, offering redemption, offering forgiveness, offering relationship with him. It's an unrivaled act of power that reveals immeasurable love and brings complete transformation. Transformation in the spiritual realm for eternity, but also God is at work transforming our own hearts as well. Yes, Jesus knows that things still haunt us, things still trouble us, things come up that are super tough. They cause pain, they cause grief, they cause hardship. But he draws alongside us in those moments, bringing us comfort, weeping with us, He will speak truth that we need to hear so that we can have our focus again fixed upon the promises that are offered. 
And he also conducts a work of transformation ongoing in our lives day by day as we look to him to make us believe this more deeply, that when those troubles come, we can, uh, we can partner with the truth more quickly. Um, and we have that assurance of salvation and that hope for the future. Yes, I know our bodies ache, our bodies age, they decay, but our spirit is being made new. Our spirit is being made whole every day as we look to him. What once was dead is being brought to life. What has been rotten away through sins of the past, maybe things you know you've done, that even if you still feel shame, there is no condemnation in Christ. Amen. Um, and maybe it sins, um, challenges that have been done to you in the past. All of these can be restored as we look to Jesus. There is nothing outside of his restora- restorative, restorative power. I can't say that one. <laughs> Hopefully you know what I'm trying to say. There is nothing he cannot do. There is no, uh, there's, there's a song that I love, that there's no wall he can't break down. There's no shadow he can't light up. There is nothing that will stop God moving and making us whole, restoring us to purpose when we continue to look to him. His glory is at stake, after all, and he will not let his glory be unnoticed. He will not abandon us. He will not fail. So Mary, Martha, and the Jews, they were wrestling with doubting God's love, with Jesus' love, doubting his timing, doubting his power through this very difficult circumstance. But to each one, Jesus lovingly speaks the truth and offers a timely comfort uh, and agreement with their emotions, with their pain. And he powerfully demonstrates his glory through an act of transformation. And he will do the same for us today. Whatever circumstances we're wrestling wrestling with, if we look to him. Romans 8 says this, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, or I could say, or sickness or loss of a loved one, the pain and the um, destruction of war? Can these things separate us? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor present things, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, God does work all things for good and for his glory. His glory is at stake, but he also works things for our good. And I know it may not be so clear what that is at the moment, but but keep trusting. Feel his embrace, feel his comfort, in what you're going through, and keep looking to him for what will happen. We can only imagine what God is doing. We've seen even just testimonies this morning of how how the displacement of people from Ukraine has actually brought people to a place where they're able to hear the gospel for the first time. It doesn't mean that all the other stuff is not relevant and not important and not painful, but we do see God is at work. Let's keep trusting. Uh, I know some of you are wrestling with, uh, struggling with family members who are sick, and that is tough. And I shared just earlier that my mum had passed away but just over three years ago. But I can see what God was doing in, in that situation. The way that God worked in my mum's heart to, to transform her relationship with him. Her prayer life in the last few years became incredible. And God was at work. And, and like what he did in her has kind of filtered down to the rest of the family. Um, God was at work even in those difficult situations. So just keep trusting. You can't see the end, but he can. Um, So keep looking to him. Let him comfort you. Let him speak truth over you. And let me just remind you of these encouraging words from Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and new earth. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain or sickness or hardship or war. For the former things have passed away. Behold, I am making all things new. 
Let's keep trusting in this, friends. Amen. We all go through problems, that's for sure. But how we respond to them, it's how a Christian is differentiated. Um, Would you stand with us for the last song? A wonderful message to keep in mind because we all will have, uh, we'll experience tragedies at one point or another. We'll uh, have sickness, wounds, pain, whatever it is. But Christ can, nothing can separate us from Christ. Amen to that? guys look like you're asleep <laughs> uh, this uh, actually the lady that I shared with you about that she came to Christ you know how a plant was seeded before she came to that church Anna is here and she knew Anna from Ukraine and she knew another lady that was Christian Marina and she said I saw how they responded to the war we all have the same loss and I noticed they had a smile and they had joy and I wanted that And today, because I heard the gospel, I understood why they're doing that. So it's important to live our faith. It's important to talk about our faith. It's important for us to understand that God is sovereign in our pain. So let's just sing about that. There is strength within the sorrow. you meet us in the morning with the love that cast out fears you are working in our waiting sanctifying us and beyond
this morning to you. And we want to declare that you are sovereign and we believe it. Lord, I pray that we will actually live it that way. Lord, I know that discouragement, struggles, uh, rejections, temptations will come our way. Lord, but we pray that nothing, nothing will separate us from you, Jesus. May we live with boldness. May we be Christians with guts. May we step up our faith. May we stop uh, being so comfortable in our little Christian home and step out, Lord. May we uh, get our hands a little bit dirty and just get involved, get involved in someone else's life. May we, Lord, uh, get out of comfort zone. Lord, I pray that you stir us, you'll wake us up, Jesus. And I pray that you will help us, Lord, to respond well to pain because we have your hope. We have your joy. We have all the resources, Lord, for life and godliness in you and because of you. We thank you, Jesus, for the cross. I pray that you bless everyone that is here. May our faith be real. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. One more sermon, people. No. Oh, no sermon. Ah. Just a quick reminder. As you go, church, please help us. We really do need your help over here. Don't forget to come grab one of the posts with your ideas. Put your name on it. Kind of let us know what you think about the different things here. That will really help us as we move forward as a church. Thank you so much. God bless you. Have a blessed Sunday.